Poetry fans, followers, friends and family. I'm Sarah Elliott and I'm joined today by the lovely Karen Jackson, the latest author that we are interviewing. Karen is the author of Overwhelmed. So we're going to get into this in a little while, aren't we Karen? But before we do, let's get a little bit of a warm up. Um, as you know, Horror Tree is a speculative fiction um websites also supported of, of writers but I've got a couple of questions that you weren't expecting so you ready okay, okay yes I'm ready. yeah <laughs> right you're stuck in a lift with a magical being which one is it between an elf a fairy or a unicorn fairy <laughs> why <laughs> I love fairy energy. It's very magical and quite mischievous and very grounded with earth energy as well. Okay, got another one for you. You accepted the challenge of saving the world from the wicked word munching wizard. Are you fighting a zombie, a vampire or a werewolf? And what weapon do you use? Oh, I love wolves. <laughs> So I'd say zombie. Yeah. And what am I using? Beams of love to take all the darkness away. Ah, oh, I love it. <laughs> Surprise questions. <laughs> yeah, they were. <laughs> and the reason I wanted to ask about um, words, because the book that you've written is very much focused on words, and that will really appeal to any writer out there, no matter what you're writing about. So with the book that you've written, Overwhelmed, what I've noticed is with all the different chapters, you're focused on different words, so words that you hear people use every day, and you've really taken the time to kind of like unpick it. So I'm curious to know what the word overwhelmed means to you now and what it might have meant, you know, a few years ago and if that's kind of like changed. Yeah, so um, I would have said many years ago, it wouldn't have really meant much to me. But what I found as I started um, being an entrepreneur in the wellness space, a lot of women, women mainly who I work with, were not getting into action and doing what they loved and their soul's purpose, which is so I specialize in helping people live their soul's purpose. So they had this passion of something they wanted to bring into the world and do. But whenever I was coaching or when I was on group calls, all I heard was, I'm so overwhelmed. And so as a coach and someone who I see patterns everywhere and I like to help people move through their, their pain, really. And what I was seeing was they weren't looking at what they were really feeling. So I'm very much into emotional intelligence. So instead of when I was coaching, I'd say I'd stop people and say, but what is it that you're feeling? What is it too much of? And we could get in and we could work and coach through those emotions and feelings and I think that words can really empower us or we can give our power away to them so now for me when I see it I just I just really want to ask them how are you really and what are you really feeling yeah and it is a word that we use an awful lot and it, it just makes me smile because I can just imagine you hearing the word overwhelmed again and again and again it's like oh, I heard that word so many times like, I'm just gonna write a book about it like, so you did yeah that is exactly what happened and all my clients know if they start to say over they're like oh I'm not gonna use the word <laughs> I'm like no what what is it like let's let's get down to it let's connect back in with yourself you know what is it so yeah I'm, I'm really passionate about it actually and it's we were talking earlier it's something it's a word I didn't really say myself much um but yeah I just hear it everywhere and I just saw the pattern I thought I, I I just really want to input into this and and get my take on it out into the world so who would you say the book is for I know I've heard you talk about your clients is a book solely for your clients or do you kind of envision it being for like a wider audience well, I envisage it for my clients. Well, for anybody who um, has, well, everybody really, because we all say I can't, I should, I must, I haven't got the time, I'm busy. But I did tailor it for my clients. But what I found was um, that a wide range of people were reading it. And like 
you know, there's um, my husband's a joiner and some of his, um, the people that he works for who have several bars were reading it and taking it, it was in Dubai and it's all over the world. And anyone who writes knows that I, it was quite scary because I was thinking they aren't the people that I wrote the book for. They mm. weren't my target audience. And yet it was spreading out and people were thinking and feeding back to me. And that was amazing, but quite scary as well. It was outside my comfort zone. So really, when I strip it back, I think it's for everybody, e everybody who's willing to grow and look into their mind. And really, for me, I once um, I've had cancer twice. So after that, well, after the first time, I really wanted to live deeply. That's something I want to like really be present and live deeply in my fullest expression without all these monkey mind threads interwoven through my mind that are holding me back or stopping me get stuck into life. And I want that for everybody. I can remember thinking after breast cancer, what can I do? And I thought, as I was a yoga, well, I still am a yoga teacher. I thought, oh, I'll teach yoga teacher to cancer survivors. And it just never came about. And I think this is it because people always said to me, you're so inspiring, you should write a book, including you. You said that at one stage to me. And um, yeah, I think this is my my way of really taking people on a journey from the limits that bind my that bound my mind and still do every now and then to just move to a bit more inner freedom and peace. Yeah, and you can see that in the book as well. We literally go on that journey with you so you can see how like you're kind of reframing things and you're um taking note of the things that you say and how you feel and I know you um do a lot of journaling as well and that's really kind of like helped you kind of like make progress through some of those blocks and limitations that you talk about so why now why did you write this book now good question it's always been on my mind and I've always been asked, you know, people have always said it to me, but I was walking in the woods with my husband, not this Christmas, the Christmas before. And I literally stopped. I'm very in touch with my intuition. I stopped and I just said to him, I'm going to write a book and it's going to be called Overwhelmed. In other words, you give your power away to. And he was like, OK, cool. So I had a lot on with because I'm, I'm an eternal student. I love studying. So I scheduled April in to actually write it. So I wrote it in April and then I came back to in August, fitting in with my schedule because I'm, I'm quite focused when I when I focus and I just finished it off. And then that, that was it. It just felt very in flow and very natural. And so it just kind of popped out, really. Literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was I'd say it was quite easeful. But what I found um, challenging was the because I did it all myself. I'm very, um, I roll my eyes sometimes, sometimes wishing I didn't do it all myself, but the editing and the proofreading took forever. I'm sure you know what that's like. Yeah. And um, pressing the button to publish and tell people took forever because I was terrified. Yeah, that's interesting you say that because um, I'm just going to read a quote from the book because this really resonated and I think it will resonate with a lot of um aspiring authors and writers. This book has been written from my heart. As I edit the pages and read the words, I can feel myself woven into it. My energy, my joy, my passion, my pain, my sadness. It is an expression of me. This feels very scary and vulnerable. In fact, it feels terrifying. Big emotion. So what helped with that? Well, I'm I'm um I do a lot of energy work, so I was smelling essential oils all the time. A lot of EFT, a lot of tapping, a lot of visualization and meditation and yoga and cacao every day, and just um sitting with my future self. Like I've I have written a book. It's here. Like I had it in my hands. It's here in my hands. Like, what would your future self do? What would, you know, the soul who's actually written this, would they just keep it to themselves or would they share it? So it was a lot of inner work. And I know that my mind wants to keep me small. So I just kept talking to it. I often say about fear, because I know, I, I know we all know fear intimately, but at one stage after my second surgery, I knew it, it was ever present. I think I was going into general anxiety. And so I decided to not try and get past my fear. I, I partner with it. So I noticed it. Oh, there you are. I know you're trying to keep me safe. 
but I'm going to do this anyway. So let's do it. And I just talk to my fear and, and move with it instead of trying to squash it down. So a lot of inner work, a lot of journaling, a lot of writing. I am an author. I'm an author. Just preparing my future self to be the author because it's something I'd never done. So it felt so alien to me. So I just kept preparing myself. No, you are, you are, you are. And in fact, I launched it very quietly because I was scared. So I think I will do a relaunch probably later in the year because I, I feel like an author now and I can own it. And as I get feedback, I'm like, I just feel it more, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I've kind of grown into that now. So I know I could talk about it from a more empowered position instead of terrified. Yeah. I, just, I love how you talked about you um, You kept telling yourself when you almost repeat it like an affirmation. And it just gave me um, an image of Bart Simpson on the on the chalkboard. I'm an author, I'm an author, I'm an author. I write it 10,000 times until it actually sinks in. So it was that kind of like constant repetition. Yeah. That helped it's re- yeah, absolutely. Reprogramming. The, de- the faulty or the default programming that I'd got from society and my own lack of self-worth at certain times in my life. So, yeah, I do see the brain is very reprogrammable with words. Yeah, yep. Words of power. <laughs> yeah. So you've yeah. talked about what helped you kind of write the book and take that final step to press publish. What hindered the process? I'd say it was doing it alone. <laughs> um, I say I found everything quite easy until the end bit. My daughter did one proofread. She was 17 at the time and gave me some clues about, oh, that makes sense to you, but that didn't make sense to me. Yeah. But then um, she was off with a new boyfriend. And so literally I was there with it for about a month, reading and reading and reading. And I kind of, I was kicking myself thinking, why do you do everything by yourself? Why can't you get, why don't you ask for help? And obviously all the, um, you know, doing the Amazon publishing, it's all new. Mm. Waiting for things and I was ordering copies that hadn't been uploaded or changed. And yeah, it was the little teething problems at the back end, really, that caused me the problems and the frustrations. Yeah. Um, So I noticed you mentioned about publishing it on Amazon. Why did you decide to kind of like self-publish rather than approach a traditional publisher? And why Amazon over like perhaps like an indie press or Lulu or something like that? I'm quite impatient (laughs) and I like my own sovereignty. So I did I did research and do a few um, courses on self-publishing and publishing. And I came to the conclusion that I don't like being told what to do. And this is an expression of me and my thoughts. And I wanted to be very raw and honest and not be filtered or made, I don't know, prettier or just more palatable. I wanted it to be my expression. So that was one. Um, And the second reason, even whether you're published or self-published, you still need to do a lot of self-promotion. Hmm. so well, I don't really know there's not much benefit and I'll be honest I just thought Amazon's easy it's well known it's print on demand yeah so a bit of laziness I'm always very brutally honest <laughs> so, yeah and I love the fact I could just do it I mean yeah. how amazing the technology like you do your manuscript you upload it and there you go a few days yeah. later you've got your hands it's mad well magical really yeah, and the fact that you've, um, like you said, you've maintained your sovereignty as well, so you've kind of kept it all in-house, you've got total control of it rather than someone else having like a um, like a vision of it and it all getting kind of skewed and changed. Yeah. So yeah, I don't understand why you did that. So in Chapter 6, which is entitled Giving Away Your Power to Time, you talk about the phrase, I'm busy. And how you've explored your thoughts around this. So tell us more about that. Yeah, well, time came in when I was being coached and I was asked um, to draw attention to the thoughts in my head. And so every hour I tuned in to what my thoughts were. And even on a calm day, my thoughts were like going on repeat like a record. I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm so busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I don't have time. I was like, whoa, that's hectic. 
that isn't calming or relaxing. I'm a yoga teacher. And so I started to look at that and really break it down. Is it true? Because it, when you know words, when you tell yourself you're busy, your whole nervous system's kicking off, you know, you're in, your adrenaline's going. And so I was aware of the impact on my wellness. I was like, no, this isn't true. So I'd stop myself. I do like a pattern interrupt, stop. And then I'd reset, um, take a breath. So anytime I find myself getting busy now, I will take a breath, smell an oil, sit, stop whatever I'm doing until I settle. And then I'll get going again when I'm back at my center. Um, so that was my experience of busy. And there was something so profound. It was in the middle of the pandemic when we could, we were allowed out for a bit. Yeah. And I met a friend, a male friend. And um, I just said to him, well, how are you? I haven't seen him for ages. And he says, oh, busy, busy, yeah, busy. As if I was going to say, oh, brilliant. Mm. So I just got to him. And so how are you then? How is that okay? And he just went, and literally just turned away from me, didn't know what to say. And then my brain sees the patterns everywhere, everywhere. And it felt like this badge of honor. And um, it was quite, it felt quite poignant and sad, actually. I didn't like it. Because again, it felt like you're giving power away. Like we need to fill our day up and busy is good. Like we have to be productive and good members of society. And yeah, it just felt really quite insidious, actually. I didn't like it. And so that was noted in my head as a potential chapter that I didn't know. But all my observations, when I sat down to write, they all kind of just came through all the patterns that I'd seen everywhere. So it's almost like you were collecting along the way, even before you knew that there was going to be a book. Because before the book, there was the podcast, wasn't there? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I think um, I just see things and these words, they kind of um, sparkle at me or draw my attention to say, come and look at me. Come and look at this. What's all this about? And then I, I go and investigate what what's in my head. What am I hearing around? I don't believe there is any truth in anything. Like I believe that there's the truth in between our thoughts. But yeah, where is the the balance and what's really going off I like to dive into that yeah I find it interesting the way that you describe your friend's kind of like reaction you know when you almost not necessarily challenged him but then repeated the question how are you know is busy is that good or bad and he almost didn't know what to say so it's almost as though I've given you an answer to the question the socially accepted answer I don't understand what you're actually asking me now yeah I mean, how sad to like, yeah, I, I found it really sad, actually. And um, when I teach yoga, I don't, um, sounds really bossy. I'm quite bossy. But when I ask my, my students how they are, we, we're not allowed to say fine, good, okay. It's like, no, how are you really? Like, I want to connect with you and get some emotional intelligence here. How are you? And I feel we've really lost that depth and everything's really we have these socially acceptable phrases that are clean and easy and not messy so like when we got on the call you said how am I I told you the truth you know yeah. we, we have a conversation I was going yeah I'm okay we have a conversation and that's it's that connection that yeah I think it's really important mm. so chapter eight is entitled the reasons not to so I'm curious to know did any reasons not to write this book come up for you yeah I can't do a book I'm not an author I can't do that what will people think who am I all those things judgment basically there was a massive fear of judgment um but mainly I think it was the tall poppy syndrome that um that's it, that's a phrase in Australia I felt like I didn't want to shine I can't shine I'm just me I need to stay small what will people say if I express myself? It was very, very vulnerable. So yeah, but again, I know that not, I know it's not real. I know it's only thoughts in my head that aren't true. So yeah, there were lots of reasons not to, and none of them stood up. So I'll write them down. Why can't I? Well, people judge me. People judge me anyway. Yeah. I know that this has flowed through me. I trust it's flowed, flowed through me for a reason. 
So uh, yeah, I get the thoughts, I write them down, then I look at them. I love to write, you mentioned jour journaling earlier, I love to write them in, in onto, here's my journal here actually, I've got a lovely journal, cloth, cloth bound journal. I, like, I like, need to feel nice. Um, and so I'll get them out of my head. I think words are more powerful when you get them onto paper and out of your head, and then you can see them, they're not scary, and you're like, well, let's do this anyway, let's see. <laughs> let's see you know because um my yoga teacher always told me that as teachers which really I think writers in a way are teachers in a way storytellers and mm -hmm. and teaching life and and visions we're not here to be liked we're here to pass wisdom down and not everyone's going to accept that wisdom or that tale even you know so many tales in in fiction as well and so not everyone's gonna like me so why would I hold back so yeah, constant. This is my head. I'm like always like this in my head. What are you thinking? Is it true? Like that. Sounds like a party in your head, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, so um when I was reading chapter 13, um, which is called I look to I look up to them because I don't feel enough, it made me think about imposter syndrome, which I'm sure is something that many writers and you know more widely creatives um often experience what's your journey with imposter syndrome so uh, the way i see imposter syndrome is at baseline not feeling enough or worthy and not only your uniqueness so my view and what i do really in, in most of my work outside of my book is that i help people including myself really get to align with your dharma your soul's purpose your uniqueness i believe that we're all needed in our unique expression and yet society um kind of discourages that really because we you know go to school there's a path isn't there that's set yeah. out for it do something different um yeah you, you, it's not always good feedback or you're discouraged from it so um I think that we are programmed to not be our full selves and that's where the imposter syndrome kicks in because of judgment because of who do they think they are all these things that society puts on us um I feel that's where it that's where it comes from I, th I think we numb ourselves down from school mm -hmm fit in and be acceptable and not rock the boat and creatives which is why I love creatives don't mm -hmm. they say they're the dangerous ones they're the ones who are going to change the world because they think outside the box and yeah so imposter syndrome for me it's not feeling enough to um, kind of align with your soul's expression and express it into the world because of fear or um, thinking that you're not worthy enough of being in your fullest expression if that makes sense it makes sense in my head yeah yeah <laughs> yes yeah, so, yeah I think that's what imposter syndrome is fear of judgment really and not feeling enough yeah because it is also do that um comparison isn't it yeah and if you're not secure in kind of like your own identity and your thought processes you can easily be kind of led led astray and earlier on when you talked about inviting fear come on in fear and doing things alongside it rather than fear holding you back I guess that that's a similar process that you would take when you're thinking about um imposter syndrome as well because like I said it's about um judgment too yeah and um so a lot of my studies in yoga yoga philosophy and also seeing people's uniqueness so what I was seeing was the light in other people and their beautiful uniqueness and that that I want to hear their stories in a coaching conversation at the start of yoga class and I want I I genuinely think I can learn something from everybody and so when I was viewing people like that I had no choice but to turn it inwards but well, why are you not enough why can't you share your uniqueness why are you different because in yogic philosophy we believe that we are all from one universal consciousness and that we we're hearing our separate selves and then we go back so it was like well you must have a, I'm putting it myself you must have a really big ego because you're different to everyone else that you believe in and so I had humor I was like oh okay <laughs> and that changed everything that reflection changed everything because yeah I'm not different I'm not the only one in the world who isn't worthy 
and yet I view everyone else as so that was a real turn you know turning the lens the the light at myself with humor to um yeah to flip that around so it's interesting that it almost feels like you pretty much woke up one day and was like I'm going to write a book <laughs> so throughout this process what what have you learned about yourself oh it's quite sad actually what I've learned about myself because I thought about this one that I don't celebrate myself enough and I, I, I promised myself I'd celebrate myself once I wrote the book because it's a massive achievement mm. it's a massive achie it's big and I did it so quietly and um, I was on a coaching session with my coach um, this last week and she said something really powerful she's talking about the masculine and feminine energies and how you know that so my book was very feminine in its flow it just came down and I it flowed out but obviously I had the masculine structure of how to lay a book out and needed a cover and a, all the bio and all that but with me launching it I'm not giving the masculine energy any praise because that masculine energy got me the book mm. and with flow it's just oh let's flow to the next thing instead of thinking no actually this is amazing you know your structure got you this book and it should be celebrated it's like no the feminine energy is going to go on to the next thing and I find that really sad and that's something that I'm re I'm working on myself and that I'll challenge myself to celebrate when I relaunch it again because literally I'll be like yay good me good on me <laughs> for like a minute and then I go off and I think that's really sad. Mm. There'll be some there. There'll be there'll be lots of things, but I haven't quite found it yet. I haven't found the the needle yet of um yeah, the energy that stops me celebrating. So that was actually the main the main thing. Um, because I, I've always written and I, I I've got a law degree, so I'm very structured. So that to me, my brain had been programmed to write like that. And I got the inspiration. I've been thinking about these things forever. So that was quite natural. But yeah, the celebrating. Yeah, I realised that's quite sad. That I won't yeah, do that. That's, that's in one of your um, later chapters in the book as well, that you talk about that too. And I thought I would celebrate it. I was like, I'm going to celebrate this. You've written it down, <laughs> really. Not truly. I mean, I've seen some of my peers have these massive book launches and they celebrate it for like a month with um, pre-launch activities and things. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Why didn't I do anything? And I'm still like this. But yeah, I think a lot of that was because I didn't believe that I was an author. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I'll hold me to it later in the year. Yes, Come back. I will. <laughs> Well, we know that you're an author and you've mentioned um, that you do, uh, that you're a yoga teacher and you've talked about coaching and clients as well. So it's it's kind of hard to sum you up. And I, I'm just going to read a little bit of your bio from the back of your book. So Karen has always been a free spirit, deep thinker and the odd one out. She believes in living life, really deeply living life especially since having cancer twice in her 30s. Karen writes to empower, to inspire, to help souls reconnect with their uniqueness and to respect that in each other. And it's just that's just beautiful. You know, you've got overwhelmed is destined to be in your hand if you've ever uttered these words and phrases. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have time. I can't. That's you. This is the book for you. <laughs> and it's been so lovely talking to you can you tell us where else we can find you yeah so this is quite funny actually because I kept changing I'm what we call multi-passionate <laughs> so uh, but I think it all leads to the same thing um so I kept changing my business name all the time so on Instagram I, I am I underscore am underscore Karen Jackson and my website is the same now because my coach was saying um, I am Karen Jackson dot co dot UK because my coach kept saying Karen you can't keep changing your name every day <laughs> <laughs> like you're right and then she said yeah just use your name I was like okay I'll use my <laughs> name I mean, you can find me there and I've got um I've got two podcasts I've got one Slow Down, Live Deeply, which is very much life coaching and probably um, where the book 
came from really um and then I've just started a new podcast called the embodied soul podcast which is uh, more about um it's more for entrepreneurs and creatives and um, blending human design and future self-work and energy energy work so that's where I'm going now. <laughs> Fair wow, that's, that's the next stop for Karen Jackson. Yeah. So before you leave us, can you just leave us with a piece of advice that you would give to um, an aspiring writer or an aspiring author? Yes. So my uh, my favourite quote at the moment is Ram Das: beyond all polarity I am. So that means a lot to me and as, a, as an author as well is understanding that we have so much polarity in everywhere in the earth but between our thoughts so I always teach my yoga students that thoughts are not real they come and go they change every minute so I'm not going to live my life according to someone else's thoughts thoughts create polarity and so I believe as long as we keep expressing our own thoughts with openness for other people's thoughts. That's where the creative energy needs to flow. So don't stop that flow for anything because what you think you might be stopping it for isn't real. Mm. It's all all pretend, it's not real. So stay true to that center of yours and that heart and that soul and just be brave and partner with your fear to stand because you think this way and you want to write these words for a reason. So just remember that, that, yeah, these thoughts aren't real, even your own. But right now they're here to be expressed because they'll just change and you'll go off and you'll come back. And yeah, because who knows what I would, if I would have wrote this in 10 years time, I don't know what I'll be thinking or where I'll be then, but it's an expression of where I am now in this moment. Beautiful, Karen. Thank you so much. So if you want to hear more from Karen, you've got the I Am Karen Jackson website. There's a podcast. There is the book, of course. (laughs) But I'm on available on um Amazon. Um so I just want to say again, Karen, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Um and thank you for writing the book and gifting us with that. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's always lovely speaking to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye.